Okay, so you've been studying uh, the political situation in Afghan on your own? Yeah, personally. You want to do a master's in uh, Southeast Asian politics or something like that? I want to do a master's in conflict resolution. Conflict resolution. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's interesting. I hope that uh, by your turnout today, somebody will watch and offer you a scholarship to do your master's in conflict resolution. And then thereafter, you want to teach, I guess. Yeah, for a while. But I'd like to go into So give us a historical perspective of the Afghan situation. Well, I think the Afghan situation, to understand the current situation, we need to go back to the 70s. 70s? Yeah, itself. Precisely 1973. Afghanistan as a country and the people itself, they dislike foreign interference. They dislike foreign interference? Foreign interference. In order to, in, in order to preserve their independence, they had three encounters with the British. The first Afghan war was, I think, 18... 1839 to 1842. Mm -hmm. And that resulted into an Afghan victory. And then the British column um, regiment that was sent to Kabul, in the course of their retreat, were annihilated. Mm -hmm. So there were a series of encounters. The second Afghan war was, I think, 1870 to 1880. So there were a series of encounters mm -hmm. in order to preserve their independence. But then in 1973, the last Afghan king, Zahir Muhammad Shah. They were a monarchy. It was, was a monarchy, monarchy. yeah. Is it, was it a theocracy or a monarchy? It was a monarchy. It was a monarchy. Okay. But then because Islam is the predominant religion and culture over there, it has mm -hmm. some influence of religion in it. Okay. And then that is why the Taliban today refer to themselves as Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. Because mm -hmm. at that time, the country was called the Emirate of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So to establish that religious and historical link okay. between they as a group or as a movement and their objective to the historic Afghan kingdom of the past. All right. But in, 1970, in the 1964, a constitution was passed that was more democratic than what they had in the past by the last king, Muhammad Zahir Shah. And that prevented the royal family, members of the royal family, from being involved in politics. So that created a feud between he and his cousin, Muhammad Dawood Khan. So in 1973, Dawood Khan overthrew his own cousin, who was the king, Zahir Shah. And that led to a series of political instability that led to the Soviet intervention and the subsequent Mujahideen resistance against Soviet Union mm -hmm. to the point where we are today. Why did Osama bin Laden come in? Because he's not from Afghanistan, is he? No, he's from Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Osama bin Laden came in during the Mujahideen resistance against Soviet Union. But then the war itself was actually not a religious war. It was a simple issue of uh, the Afghans resisting Soviet occupation. That was occasioned by the that when, what do you call it, Daoud Khan overthrew the king, he established a single party state. But then the party in which he's from, the People Democratic, Democratic Party of Afghanistan, had two factions, the Parachamists and the Khalkis. The Parachamists, which Mahmoud Khan belonged to, was made up of members of the royal family, the business elite, the urban intelligentsia, and the rest. But then the Khalkis unit, the, Khalk, the word Khalk actually means people, which is the other faction of the ruling party then, People Democratic Party of Afghanistan, was made up of people with peasant and background. And that was more strong among the communists. So it was the, the tussle between the Khalkis and the Parachamist faction of the PDPE that led to the Soviet intervention. So Osama bin Laden came in during the Soviet intervention. Hmm. But the Americans came into Afghanistan, and uh, we have some videos of Afghanistan that uh, they'll be showing as we talk. Osama bin Laden came to Afghanistan uh, fundamentally, uh, the Americans came to Afghanistan fundamentally because the uh, 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 Afghan had become a safe haven for bin Laden, who was, who, uh, who was said to be responsible for the 9-11 the crisis. Is that not so? That was a simplification of the whole issue. The world pushed the Taliban under the fold of bin Laden. No, say that again. That was a simplification of the whole issue. The mm -hmm. world pushed the Taliban under the fold of bin Laden. Osama bin Laden and his Arab colleagues came to Afghanistan during the resistance against the Soviet Union. But they were invited in by a Palestinian scholar, Sheikh Abdullah Yusuf Azam. Mm -hmm. He was based in Peshawar. He transformed the Afghan resistance war into a jihad because he declared it to be a jihad, a religious struggle. But in the context of jihad, he was referring to as a defensive jihad. We have a religious duty to resist occupation. The Afghan civil war was fought between who and whom? The Afghan civil war was fought between the different factions. Mm -hmm. 
that collectively overthrew the Soviet Union. You know, in the, fight, in, in the course of over fighting the Soviet Union, it was an era of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Soviet Union was a colonial authority. Soviet occupation of Afghanistan mm -hmm. occurred during the Cold War. Yes, correct. But the Cold War itself wasn't cold. It was cold because the leading powers of the day, the Soviet Union and the US, weren't fighting each other. Mm -hmm. But beneath the Cold War were a series of hot conflicts. So proxy wars. Proxy wars. Yeah. Like, like what we have in Angola, mm -hmm. what we had in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So US saw an opportunity to embarrass Soviet Union after their, their failure in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So they channeled weapons and resources to the Pakistanis, mm -hmm. to the Mujahideen factions that were resisting Soviet Union. So the Mujahideen was the resistant army to the Soviet Union. They were the faction. And Osama bin Laden fought alongside the Mujahideen. Osama bin Laden was one of those who joined the Mujahideen in the struggle. Mm -hmm. Likewise, the current leadership of the Taliban were junior commanders and mid-ranking officers in the Mujahideen factions. Mm -hmm. But after the defeat of the Soviet Union, their withdrawal in 1989, mm -hmm. the various factions couldn't agree on what form of government should Afghanistan have. So that, that brought about the Afghan civil war? Of 1992 to 1996. Mm -hmm. But then Taliban was born out of the chaos of this period. But don't forget, the international community neglected Afghanistan and left the Afghans with their feet. Mm -hmm. So Taliban emerged out of the chaos mm -hmm. as an internal reaction to the chaos that was left behind by the Soviet Union. The Taliban was born in Kandahar. Mm -hmm. And legend has it that a girl was raped and Mullah Umar was a madrasa teacher, which an Islamic teacher then in Kandahar, which was his hometown. Yeah. So he came out with his group of students, went and featured out the culprits, hanged him. Mm. And that was how come the Taliban was born. Mm -hmm. And from 94 onwards, they started their march. But don't forget, Afghanistan is just behind Pakistan. And Pakistan was bearing the brunt of the instability in Afghanistan because it was harboring the refugees. It was looking for a way out. So it, it identified the Taliban as a potential allies. That's how come Pakistan and the Taliban became allies. And the Taliban was supported by Pakistan. And they conquered Kabul in 1996. Just like we are here today, Taliban in power. In 1996 and today, we have the same situation. Should we recognize the Taliban or delegitimize them? And who knows what happened next? Because in 1996, when they got to Kanda, uh, Kabul, and captured the Afghan state, only three countries recognized the Taliban government. So when the Taliban uh, got Kabul, who yeah. was the vanquished party in that 1996 episode? It was Shah Masood, mm -hmm. Ahmad Shah Masood. Mm -hmm. We have the Burhaudin Rabani. The war was divided Kabul into fiefdoms. So, so Mujahideen was gone? The Mujahideens were then in control of Kabul. But there was no single power in Kabul. Everybody has his own little domain. But the Taliban vanquished them entirely. Mm -hmm. And then the Taliban captured actually 90% of the country. So the former Mujahideens went to northern Afghanistan. And they were allies of the US in the 2001 occupation. That's what they called mm -hmm. the Northern Alliance. I'm sure you've heard of it. Mm -hmm. So it was the former Mujahideens who formed the Northern Alliance, who were in control of the northern half of the country. And that is why when the Taliban were about to embark on their present offensive, started from the north, mm -hmm. to make sure that resistance they had in their days in power, would not emerge from the north again. I see. So for the period that America was there, up until recently, yeah. who was in charge? It was... When America was in power, we had what we called, what they called the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. After the overthrow of the Taliban, a conference was held in Bonn. Mm -hmm. That was December in 2001. And an interim administration was formed. But mind you, the Afghans don't like foreign intervention. They have their way of consulting and coming to a conclusion, what we call the lawyer jirga. And if you remember when Ghani was going into negotiating with the Taliban, he formed the lawyer jirga. It's a garden where you invite all the power brokers on the ground, the tribal heads. Afghan is a very tribal society in Afghanistan. They're passionate precisely. To invite the clan head, the tribal heads, the Islamic scholars to come into a larger gathering. And then you discuss the issue at stake, and then come to a resolution. But the US went into the war with a maximalist approach, when they should have used a minimalist approach. Imagine if America was just there to bomb key strategic locations. But they were there to kill, to eliminate Osama bin Laden, which they did. 
10 years later also. Yes, after the elimination of bin Laden, what, what was the continued role of the United States? They were, they were supporting the Afghans to form their own government and building their military and their police. Why was that unsuccessful? One, because the whole concept of nation building by outsiders in Afghanistan has never succeeded. The Soviets went and realized their mistake after 10 years of their stay. The Afghans have a very unique name, people call them. When you type, just open Google and type graveyard of empires, only one country surfaces. Afghanistan. What of empires? Graveyard of empires. Graveyard of empires. Can you do that for me? Type graveyard of empires. Let's Afghanistan see. will surface. It has been hostile to every invader. So by establishing the interim government in Bonn, you gave it an appearance of being a foreign entity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But mind you, the Taliban living office didn't lose credibility totally. So where have they been since the Americans took them out? Where have they been? Mullah Omar made a promise before he left. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was interviewed, mm -hmm. I think, a couple of years later by Pakistan journalists. Mm -hmm. And he said he has two things to prove. That one, Bush has claimed that George Bush, as why US president, claims that the world is small. And anywhere he seeks to hide, American power will fetch him out. Mm -hmm. And the other promise is the promise of God, mm -hmm. that the earth belongs to God, and anywhere he go, he shall find refuge. Mm -hmm. And he awaits which of the two promise will triumph. And as he stands today, the latter triumph, that the earth belongs to God, and Mullah Omar will surely find refuge. Because he died of natural cause, not from US. Oh, he's dead? Yeah, Mullah Omar is dead. I think he died somewhere. His death was around somewhere 2013, there about. Mm -hmm. That was even in, and moreover, U.S. not being able to establish itself in Afghanistan has a couple of factors. First one was the, the scope of the operation. It was maximalist, not minimalist in the onset. Second thing was that they But you can't go to a country when you want to dominate and you want to eliminate Osama bin Laden and go as a minimalist approach. You can't do that. You would have to go as a maximalist the Taliban, to take control, absolute the control. The Taliban didn't refuse to hand over Osama bin Laden. The question was that they needed evidence to prove that he committed the crime. And that's a rational question. Didn't Bin Laden himself say that he committed the offense of 9-11? He was he say? asked. Al-Qaeda, his group, Al-Qaeda didn't... Al-Qaeda took credit for the attack. But then, there's one credible source of information. The book written by Mullah Abdul Salam Zaif. He happens to be the Taliban ambassador to Pakistan. It was a, it's an autobiography, My Life with the Taliban. Mm -hmm. The Taliban gave US three options. US refused to accept either of the three according to him, based on what he said in the book. One, give us your evidences. Mm -hmm. So we tried the man under Islamic laws in our land. US refused. The second option was that let's form a joint commission to try the man. US declined. And the third option was an international trial where the man will be sent to US-friendly nations in the Gulf, probably Qatar or UAE or any other country in the Gulf, where then the US will bring their own legal team, expert with their own evidences, and then the Taliban also send their own delegation, where the man will be tried. If found guilty, will be dealt with. U.S. refused the whole of these conditions. But the Taliban, as steep as they are in the Pashtun tradition, the Pashtuns have a tradition called Pashtunwali, code of ethics of every Pashtun. Mm -hmm. You protect your guests, even at the expense of your life. So based on this principle, Mullah Omar refused to hand over Osama bin Laden to the US, one, the fact that he said he could not betray his guest. That makes him a bad Pashtun. Mm -hmm. Secondly, he could not hand over a Muslim to a non-Muslim for trial. I see. OK, we have, we have one minute to, uh, to end of this segment. So let me ask you, because we have to talk to you again. What do you foresee will happen in the, in the near future? In Afghanistan, precisely? Yes, in Afghanistan, yeah. I don't foresee Taliban relinquishing power, but I don't see Taliban going to their way 20 years back. But look at this video, for instance. Yeah. Uh, the Afghan people seem like they don't want the Taliban. It looks like they want to leave. They are, they are resisting. Uh, they, they are stopping the American aircraft from going. They want to be on the plane. They want to leave Afghanistan. They don't want to be under the, the rule and thumb of the Taliban. Do you also observe that? Well, it has been acknowledged that the majority of those running are those who served with the occupation. Who served with the occupying forces? Or the, with the Americans, yeah. and they know them. No, them. It wasn't just Americans who were there. Mm -hmm. It was NATO. 20, NATO, yes, yes. 28th country. America was just the lead power. Mm -hmm. 
who were translators, interpreters, or whatever. Okay. So these people are afraid for their lives? For their lives. And I think, to me, it's because they have, in one way or the other, committed crime against some of the Taliban. Because mm -hmm. first of all, U.S. has detained people in Guantanamo Bay for the past 20 years, mm -hmm. and no one has been tried. Because U.S. doesn't even have, it means it's either U.S. doesn't have the evidence it purported to have, or the people are just innocent. Mm. And secondly, the Afghan security forces and their U.S. allies, and the world was that the U.S. Another thing was that U.S. brought in non-credible actors. Mm -hmm. They brought in warlord, warlords who have tainted reputation. So will the Afghan rule under Sharia law? Or will, will, they, will the Taliban rule under, under Sharia law? Even under Sharia law, we have to, I'm quite skeptical about it. Because we have sectarian differences in Islam. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Afghanistan is a Sunni majority country. Sunni. Sunni majority mm -hmm, country, mm -hmm. which follows the Hanafi school of thought. So, so, so they are not. Um, uh, Afghan is not. Is not a, a, a Shia country. A Shia. No, no, no. Okay. But then they have Shia minorities who are the Hazaras. Uh -huh. But in terms of jurisprudence, these two um, sects have two different jurisprudence. The Afghan Sunnis follow the Hanafi school of thought. The Shias follow the. But the Tali Taliban are Sunnis. Sunnis. Okay. But then the Afghan and the Hazaras follow the Shia Jafari jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. So the question is, whose Sharia are you going to implement? And whose Sharia are you going it to implement? It will be the Sunni Sharia if they have to be Sharia. If they have to be Sharia. Mm -hmm. But then that will be violating the rights of the other side. Are the Taliban not accustomed to violating people's rights? Well, they were exorcists in the past. Mm -hmm. But then I believed, had the world extended an olive branch to them. Perhaps the world might, might have been able to limit their excesses. But then by neglecting them totally to, their, to themselves, we push them to the mercy of extreme forces. Don't forget the Taliban Jihad is actually territorial. Their goal is to govern Afghanistan. Osama bin Laden's Jihad is transnational. Mm -hmm. So US had a chance of creating a wedge between these two competing ideologies. But intelligence failure, perhaps poor policy formulation by Washington experts under Bush administration, didn't realize that you could easily, you could easily create a division between these two allies. Mm -hmm. But today, the Taliban has got you what it lost. So what, what do you expect to see in a year from now as we wrap up on this conversation? In a year from now, well, I, I pray that the Taliban live up to its statement. Which is what? of not abusing people's and civil rights of the citizens. No vindictiveness. No vindictiveness. Respect for human rights. Allowing females to participate in governance. And then, above all, respecting the rights of ethnic minorities, like the Tajikis, the Uzbeks. Uh, OK, but would it be fatal if NATO begins to consider a proposal to get back into Afghanistan and take out the Taliban? Would it be suicidal for NATO to start thinking like that? It would be disastrous if 20 years Mm -hmm. You couldn't do you it. You couldn't achieve your goal. I don't think an 100 years more will make a difference. Mm, I see. I'll leave it here, Abdul. Uh, but we, will, we have to uh, support you to do your, your, your master's in conflict resolution uh, for doing what you're doing on your own. So what do you do these days after university? You teach? No. What do you do? You research? I research most of the time. Mm -hmm. Ever since the Taliban got to Kabul, or even when they, ever since they launched the offensive, I've been following the Al Jazeera news platform mm -hmm. daily. I see. And moreover, there's one thing they did which is very interesting. Before embarking on their offensive, they visited all the neighboring countries. Including Pakistan? They started by visiting Pakistan. Mm -hmm. They went to Iran. They went to Uzbekistan. No, I think Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Russia, China. This is a way of assuring the people that we have nothing against you. Mm. So it seems when they got assurance that those regional powers wouldn't intervene, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then they launched the offensive, and then here we are. So they know how to negotiate. They understand power dynamics. If you look at, yeah, and they really understand the Afghan terrain mm. than the government created by U.S. Because if you look at how districts, provinces were surrounded without firing a bullet. Are the activists of Afghan Western trained? Or do they have some Western trained among them? Is it the Afghan National Army? No, I mean the Taliban. Do they have Western the Taliban? trained? Mm. I think the, the best... Foreign training they could have gotten would have come from Pakistanis. Okay. And the Pakistanis' involvement in Afghanistan has two distinct reasons. One is military and 
geostrategic for security reasons mm -hmm. because of the Durand line mm -hmm. and they needed they have what we call a policy of defense and strategic debt product mm -hmm. which was formulated by the former chief of army staff uh, general Aslan Beg in case Pakistan is about to lose an encounter with pa India you know India and Pakistan are arch foes in a war the Pakistanis should be able to withdraw all their military logistics command and control quote and unquote to the Afghan tell you to mount a final counter-attack. Very interesting, Abdul. Let me, let me leave it here. I'll take a break and... Uh... <laughs>